Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Darshan Talks. We're going live again, and we have with us Ken Spidell, who is Vice President at Gates Healthcare. And Ken and I have spoken a couple of times now because um, we were looking at working on a project together. This is the Darshan Talks podcast, regulatory guy, irregular podcast with host Darshan Kulkarni. You can find the show on Twitter at Darshan Talks or the show's website at darshantalks.com. Ken, do you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Well, thank you, Counselor. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to to meet with you and your audience. That's fantastic. So hopefully we have folks on that will type in any questions and those type of things as you go through that. Um, well, I am Ken Spidell. I am a uh, pharmacist by, by undergraduate in terms of my doctorate, in terms of uh, a pharmacy. So uh, I've got my PharmD, so BS as well as went on and got my PharmD. Uh, I've been blessed with uh, an array of opportunities and practices and practice settings and I just like a lot a variety. I, I've, I've done so much, you know, and you talk acute care and community and home infusion and compounding and academia and, and, and love it all. I probably the, the thing I haven't really done and I've, I've done it in a very indirect fashion is their radionucleotides and those type of things. So I'll call it the nukes things, but I've, I've placed students in those settings and observed those settings, but I've just been blessed. So um, I'm a vice president uh, of compounding compliance with Gates Healthcare Associates. Uh, it's a wonderful company to work work with. Uh, it's a great team that we have together. So we've, we've got a whole consortium of people with different expertises, and, and uh, we work a lot on the regulatory sides of things and uh, clinical support and technical support and those type of things. So it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, background wise, just quickly, I come from, I guess my beginnings or uh, I guess my really early beginnings, community uh, uh, pharmacy, because my father was a community pharmacy and a pharmacist in multiple locations. So I'll just call myself a snotty little nosed kid, just kind of running around, kind of helping dad out and a variety of different things and watching what he did and then things. And that kind of spawned my interest in the pharmacy. And then from there, really liked the clinical aspect and the acute care. So I did acute care, loved, loved, loved that. But then just, you know, wanted to tie in some uh, community roots. So did that as well and kind of did multiple things. And then from there, they went into home infusion uh, associated with a hospital affiliated home infusion uh, uh, group and set that up. I actually set up my home own home infusion when home infusion really wasn't even known. Um, set out the first EPN patient in um, in in my community uh, for, for home TPN, and that was a whole learning process and whatever. And it was a very positive outcome. And then that kind of spawned. It was beautiful because it it it, it I, I'd say it melded the the clinical as well as the pharmaceutical. So the aseptic techniques and the whole thing. I remember purchasing a, an aseptic hood and validating because I did that in the hospital a lot, right. but it, and then taking it into the community, having to do that. So it was really interesting monitoring her labs, which really was my forte and, and, and then that and then getting more patients and all that. So starting that whole world and then developing that for um, a health system affiliated program and running that for quite a while. Then that morphed and they say, hey, can you can do sterile? Can you do non-sterile stuff? So I said, oh, sure. <laughs> so I always loved pharmaceutics and pharmaceutical technology and kind of took that and kind of developed that. And uh, from then, then got into uh, academia and compounding and I had my own compounding lab and academia yell out and say, hey, can you teach us? I'd love, love to teach and and still do. and and and. and was uh, <clears throat> was on faculty there uh, for, for for at University of Finley in uh, Ohio, and taught there for many years. And then uh, I now teach on behalf of uh, multiple companies and commission to teach on a variety of different topics. And love doing that. Really, 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 really love the teaching. Really like to see the kind of deer in the headlights kind of look. <laughs> and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, kind of thing. And then the whole kind of the, the jaw comes out. So, so, and then they have physicians. I teach a lot of physicians and practitioners now. And, um, it's really, really neat to be able to, I guess I'll be selfish. Darshan is, is as you know, 
teaching, you know, one person is wonderful because ex exponentially you can affect patient care, you know, yeah. to the number of patients they see. And then, but you, you got a room of, you know, 40, 50 people, you know, you can influence patient care. You hope you do. Uh, you know, I get feedback and they say, you know, thank you for what you did. I just, you know, it worked. I was just doing a conference, a, a, a national, uh, international conference. And somebody said, uh, Dr. Spidell, you recommended this. I just want to let you know, and it was in front of all these people. I just want to let you know it worked unbelievably, you know, kind of thing. And patients doing well. And then, you know, it wasn't my show. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, is they were just acknowledging the fact that, you know, they ab absorbed that. And then they took the principle even further than I even suggested. So it's it's, it's a wonderful world to do. Um so teaching, love that. The the compliance thing, which is big, as you well know, counselor, in regards to being compliant with all of the regulations and the pending regulations and the proposed regulations and the in the compliance uh, <clears throat> guidance and various things like that and how all that just gets in there. So I, I like trying to take some of the complexity out. And I know that's your forte taking the complexity out, working with clients and, and working with professionals. And we're talking about physicians, veterinarians. We're talking about pharmacies, um, facilities, and trying to get the facilities compliance. So it's great. That's great. So that's kind of me. I've been blessed. I've been the president of the National Home Infusion Association. I've been president of hospices, uh, working because that's near and dear to my heart for personal reasons and just, just love trying to make a difference. So. And that's what we do as healthcare professionals. That's right. So here's a question for you that um, we, we had a little pre-conference to talk about things, but I'm going to already veer off. So here's my first question. You talked about starting out in community pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And everyone talks about how community pharmacy is dead and that there's no way of succeeding. Knowing what you know now, know, uh, knowing your own experiences in community pharmacy, knowing how you help um a variety of independent owners of pharmacies is that true are our community pharmacies dead no 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 they're not dead but the diversification is so necessary for them to do to to figure out the other niches i mean obviously the big big box people you know they they send it to the send it to the door in a box and all that stuff but you know we, we, we are professionals in that service side of things in that touching and now you have pharmacists are going to be administering, and they already are, the, the COVID vaccine, administering other inoculations. And so so the, the community in the world seeing now, I'm not saying the big Zox people aren't doing their inoculations as well and, and what have you, but to get it in and, and, and seeing seeing the pharmacist and working with the pharmacist and the, and the medication regimens that are out there are so complex and to have them boil it down and work with them. And so that's what I work with the people. Now, I don't profess to be a community pharmacy specialist by any means, but in terms of working with them to help their diversification and help them on the clinical side. I mean, you know, one of my specialties uh, is on the endocrinology side of things and working with them. So if, you know, patient is on, uh, I'll, I'll call it horsicillin, <clears throat> uh, the horsicillin, it may be an extract that was derived from the urine of a pregnant mare. And that particular substance, you know, may be causing an effect on the patients and say, OK, can we complement that, increase the excretion of what we call the catechol estrogens and reduce the, the risk to them from some estrogen related pathology or whatever. And here's how you can maybe augment that with a complementary cell in nutraceutical, those kind of things and how you can change their lifestyle and all that. All those wonderful things. That's not going to happen in a big box. That's going to happen in, in, I'll call it the little box, but some community pharmacy is quite large. And a lot of the compounding really came from the community pharmacy side of thing. They right. said, hey, I got to diversify. I just can't keep count, lick, stick and pouring these things. I want to make sure that I can bridge that. And I, I, when, I, when I promote compounding is because it worked for me. You take the clinical component, you take the pharmaceutical sciences, you know, and, 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 you, and you put it in a blender and you add a special sauce or two in there and you, you blend it up and you pour it and you got this awesome smoothie. And yeah. we're talking about compounding pharmacy. So, so you, what, what I hear you saying is there is an opportunity, but if you if you try to just be the next guy who's going to lick, stick, count, pour, <laughs> you're probably not going to make it. What you need to do is provide a special sauce. And yeah. the special sauce can be a variety of things, whether it's the COVID vaccination, whether it's com compounding, 
uh, or whether it's managing people who are doing all these different things from different modalities right. and you helping them guide right. them. Um, right. what, are the, what are the more non-traditional ways you've seen compounding pharmacies um, sort of delve into other other formats, if you will, in a way that supports the patient? Good, great question. So <clears throat> one of the things I've seen is people specialize, you know, it, it's a community pharmacy, but also have a subspecialty and say, we take care of your, your four-legged animals and they right. work closely. And this is the important point. They work closely with veterinarians. Yep. Now, if, <laughs> veterinarians always believe, and I've tried to change this paradigm at the university. We, I, I, I called it Camp David, <laughs> the Accords. And I tried to, and so I got the vets and the pharmacy people together and the vets say, you're the people that are taking all our business and all our money away. You're the people, you know, they think 1-800-blank-blank, vet med, you know, whatever, and those things. And they, they think, the, the, well, those are pharmacists taking that. Yeah. No, they're not. Um, generally, those are big conglomerates. Um, one group are owned by a bunch of anesthesiologists, another group are owned by another. You know, my point is, these pharmacies say, okay, I see that relationship with the vets and I see this. And so they keep a, a, a subset, and I've seen this numerous times, a subset business and say, we're going to, we're going to have uh, um, toys for your animals here, specialty toys. We're going to have specialty uh, um, little, little foods and different things in here as well, but we're going to take care and work with your vet very closely and be able to formulate things in the, to help to peel the cat? No, we're actually gonna create a paw paste, something you're gonna put on a cat that's still doing hygiene, and they're gonna put it on, the cat's saying, I've gotta get this off, and it just, yeah. you know, the bioavailability yeah. is amazing, because they want that off. And so, work with the vet in, in the peony of the ear, and different things like that, and and try to work that. So, you know, that's, that's one niche. Obviously, the niche of nutraceuticals, you know, to try to, from a consultation sense, and say, have somebody that is a nutritionist to say, you know, let's work on this and say, okay, here's here's these lines of nutraceuticals because you probably know this, Darshan. And it's a good thing. The FDA is not overseeing the the nutraceutical sides of things in terms of, hey, this comes up, but the claim, you got to watch the claims and those types of things. But the fact of the matter is, is done numerous examinations of these things in terms of the literature as well as certificate analysis as well as actually assays you should see some of these things you know there, there was one study looking at dhea in the united states and and this was published and they looked at 15, 17 different formulations of dhea and three had zero the average was about 82 percent and one had 152 percent of dhea so trying to come up with ones that have, you know, the proper. And so, it, you know, people take these, what I'll call the fur ball of, of nutraceuticals, and they just get this and get this and get this. And they just, I heard it was good, but the quality. And so I think these community pharmacies that specialize in that right. and working with them and collaborate with functional medicine specialists and those type of things, it's a wonderful world. So anyway, they, there's, they just have to think outside the box. And I'll tell you, there's some brilliant, brilliant, brilliant pharmacists and owners and, and entrepreneurs out there doing a fantastic job. So I think, you know, NCPA and those like, you know, they always will award, you know, pay attention to those people and how they're trying to diversify things. So, so here's my question. You talk about working with nutritionists. You talk about working with physicians. You talk about working with vets. Um, if I'm a community pharmacist and I'm going, okay, I'm, I'm open to this. Are you suggesting, suggesting that they walk into a vet's office or a nutritionist's <laughs> office, or what's the best way for them to actually reach out to them? So, yeah, I, I think, first of all, you have to understand the veterinarian patient. I've, I've seen people and, and my wife and I, we, we have, we have animals and, but I've seen people come into the vet's office or whatever, you know, and they're, you know, they don't want to sit down. They say, you, know, you got, you know, you got that smell that hits you, you know, and then the barking and the meowing and all this is going on. And then, and, you know, I, I remember there was years ago, I was quasi involved in it, but the representative that was the sales representative going out and seeing the vets hated animals. Animals can smell whether you hate them. And the people that love animals can actually see that you hate animals. So you got to love animals and you have to understand the physiology of right. the animals and the pharmacology that approaches those. 
So if you go in there and say, hey, I, you know, I can provide you with all the drugs, they'll probably throw you out head first because they're going to, again, see you as competition, even though you're not. You have to approach and say, I'm your problem solver. I'm going to help you. And here's some suggestions when you have maybe an elderly person that is just getting scratched up by the cat. I love the cat, but I got to give it this this because, you know, some sometimes these cats get a hyperthyroidism and we need to kind of knock the thyroid levels down a little bit. But trying to pill it with methimazole or something like that isn't going to happen. And so how can we do that? And, you know teach the vets how we can do it and how you can help them and augment and, and, and improve the safety of your patients and on and on. It's, but you have to be very careful because they're going to see you as competition. Right. right. And you, you have to approach it as augmentation, not competition. Okay. You're here to augment. You're here to synergize. The one and one doesn't equal two anymore. It's going to equal three and four. We're going to try to you know work collectively. I'm not here to compete with you. But we can help, you know, we can help promote your practice too. You know, where's your business cards? Give me some placards. Give me some things because we have a lot of patients come in here. And so I think that whole kind of synergistic approach and collaboration, whether it's a nutritionist as well, say we got a nutritionist here, we got a functional medicine practitioner, you know, you just have to kind of work your special. But then while you appreciate, you have to maintain the Switzerland kind of thing, you know, I, you know. I, I, I'm, I'm an independent kind of country. I don't get involved with the crazy dictator over here or the passive country over here. I'm just kind of here, you know, so you have to play that, that, that role, but you know, obviously there's so much out there and, but it's tough. I mean, the margins of typical community pharmacy, and again, I'm not intimately involved in that, but it's, it's, it's crazy. And so the diversification to the service side of things, and, and we, we hope we will continue and get provider numbers and all those kind of things. We hope that will continue. So, so if that's true, and you're talking about these vet, vet practices, and I know based on conversations you and I have had, uh, you've actually helped with multi-state vet practices. In yeah. those situations, and, and you've actually done it recently. So I guess I have two questions. One is, if you are a community pharmacy and um, you're working with a vet practice, or if you're a vet practice who's multi-state, how do you deal with the challenges? What are the biggest challenges that you'd face, and how do you deal with them that you've sort of seen? Unfortunately, as you well know, there's no homogenization of the regulations. Yeah, and you know, and, and I, you know, I I can't be a specialist in. 50 plus states and I'm not licensed in the 50 plus state, which would require me to be aware of all of their, their state regulations. So the federal regulations, they start crossing state borders in terms of, you know, the provision of services. If you're a pharmacy providing services for those people or the vet centers themselves, what really is driving my involvement in a lot of the, the interstate uh, vet centers is has to do with compliancy with the hazardous drug standards. Um, if you've ever been in a, in a practice, a, a vet practice, and you see the practices going on, sure, there's some great ones. There really is. Yeah. They've done a good job. But there's, there's a lot of naivete that's going in there saying, well, we never had to do that before. Well, you have to do it but because you're exposing. I mean, you should see the, the volumes of chemicals and things that their staff, the technicians, are being exposed to. And, and really the lack of consistency in regards to compliancy with the standards of practice. So when, when they realize by their vet boards that, that, hey, by the way, you know, this thing's called, it's called USP 800 and it's a hazardous drug thing. And you're going to be, have to be compliant with it because it's not just for pharmacists only. And so they're realizing that. And so they say, well, we have to do some brick and mortar changes of our facility, or we're going to build another facility. How are we going to do this? So we work with them, all right? It, it, so you come and you do a baseline assessment and you, you go there and say, okay, here's, here's where you are here. <laughs> and here's where you need to be. <laughs> right. Oh, right. There's a big gap here. Right. So we got to fill that gap. And it, it's, it's just amazing. And I've never had a negative experience, but it's like, I never knew we had to do that. You know, you know, and again, we can argue and say 800 is not in compliance yet, but, OSHA has been in compliance in terms of hazardous drugs for years. Right. And so, you know, the thing that you'll notice the difference is maybe you'll have the board of, of, of pharmacy or, or the board of veterinary medicine or the board of medicine, if you're an oncologist or something like that, taking care of um, humans 
or an oncologist taking care of animals, they say, I never had to do this. But we've had OSHA will come into play usually when some some person says, I've been harmed by it. An employee has yeah. been harmed by it. And you don't want those boys and girls walking in there. So we have to understand there's been hazardous drug standards for you. And you understand that it has those drug standards for years. So we need to be compliant now. Right. And it's just frankly good practice. I always I always tell people, and I just, just had this conversation. Somebody said, well, I'm going to do my hazardous drugs and my non-hazardous drugs in the same room. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Oh, and I'm going to do my hazardous vet meds in the same room I'm doing my hazardous human and non-hazardous human yeah. in the same room and it just so happened this particular one there were several people on the call one person just 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 had a baby i said well you know i hope this never happens but you might have to compound something for your baby or somebody's baby or somebody's loved one how do you feel about that knowing there's cyclophosphamide right there Right. Or some hazardous chemical, maybe a reproductive hazard, you know, and say, so how do you feel about that with a new baby? Honestly, d d d d <laughs> there was no pushback after that. I mean, it just always no pushback. You're, you're right. We need a separate room. I said, yes, you do. Um, so I have a question from um, an individual who wrote in. If the FDA does not regulate these products in, in terms of safety, efficacy, and quality, how will patients be protected? So I guess the question really is, yeah, right. is, is this self-regulated? And if it's self-regulated, how do you protect patients? Well, it's not self-regulated. I mean, you know, and that's a lot of people's uh, uh, argument is in terms of, well, it's, it, you know, you, you, you've got a bunch of uh, people that are out there going rogue here, and they're just kind of coming up with their own perspectives. And one thing I always, I always, when I teach, I always create this distinction. First of all, we don't, we don't produce products. We produce preparations. And so I create, I, I make that distinction because it's important to create that distinction for the regulators. So in terms of people that can potentially have exposure to these preparations, which essentially are products manufactured by FDA inspected, FDA approved labs that are products that are monographed. Mm -hmm. That means the USP has monographed them and they're they're okay. Powders, bulk powders, those types, and then formulated it into maybe a different delivery system, dosage form, something like that. Did we have, and we've had standards for many, many years called the United States Pharmacopeia, which is a nonprofit organization that sets the standards of practice for pharmacy in a variety of different fields. And by the way, manufacturers use that as well and say, we've got our standard that, you know, that they apply to, to certain standards in, in the compendium and all that. And well, we've got standards too. This is the world I love to try to influence because we have good people intending and doing the right thing based on the standards of practice. And one of the things I go around, frankly, the world, and I apply the practices and again, say, here's the standard of practice with acquisition of your chemical. Maybe right. you have, maybe you have a recitation responsibility for the person, for the company you're buying it for. So you have this, this standard and you say, okay, this chemical has to be this grade, this grade, this grade, this grade, this, and then here's how we qualify the vendor. And so you qualify the event. That's just that. But then the formulation process, how do we know it's quality? We can do external testing and all that. So those kind of things are becoming more of the standard of practice. And we, well, sure, there's some naivete and there's some people that are learning, but true in medicine too, physicians and veterinary medicine, people do things differently, but people, you just have to find their other higher quality. Now, I was very involved and I, I helped write the original standards and actually construct the original pharmacy compounding accreditation board. Many years ago, I sat in a, a NABP board office in, in, in Chicago area and, and just we just, just hashed this whole thing out and constructed it. And I was one of their, I helped write the standards and just a very small group of people. We wrote the initial standards and I was on the initial standards committee and then the ongoing standard committee could be doing better and better. better. So I was one of their first surveyors that went out and assess that and so we have standards that we have accrediting bodies we have standards we have those processes we have state boards of pharmacy that have regulations on this so i know it seems like the wild wild west but the fact of the matter is you got to find the people and i know that's a challenge 
but you have to find the people that do it right. And I would just ask the question, if you're going to go in and interview a compounding pharmacy or pharmacist and say, how do you know that if you had to take care of one of your loved ones, pharmacist, how do you know it's going to be the highest quality? Can you give me your answers? And then if you get a bunch of stuff, it's not making any sense or whatever, and it's not, they say, I want to know how you protect your loved ones. How are you going to protect mine? So, so let me ask you a follow-up question to that, because that's actually another follow-up question we just got, which is, so far we've talked primarily about um, manufacturing and we've taught or, or compounding and the idea of how do you ensure adult prevent adulteration and misbranding by adhering to USB standards. The question I, I just got is, well, that's great. How do you now look at safety and efficacy in those same uh, products? And in, in the case of clinical research, you have what are called uh, clinical research associates who often audit your uh, safety and efficacy trials. So yeah. is there such a thing in the context of compounding? And, and how do you address that? Well, it, the, the point that I, I, I want to make, and I have made for many, many years, compounding is personalization. It's individualization. And when you're, when, you're, when you're in the manufacturing and you're on the pharma side of things, you have to, sure, you, you do your phase one, two, three, and then your, your follow-up phase four, sure. uh, post-marketing surveillance and all those kind of things. To try to take a drug to market, we all know that costs so many billion. billions and millions of dollars to try to do that. It's cost prohibitive to do these studies and do them with the rigor that's necessary on the FDA side of things. We can't do that. But what we what we attempt to do in that regard is we try to take these 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 known moieties, these known chemicals and say, well, if I can, if, if, if the typical dose is orally, enterally, and it goes in the gastrointestinal tract and goes in and, 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 and the gut goes and picks up in the liver and gets metabolized or whatever, okay. Well, if it needs to be metabolized, then okay, maybe we can change the delivery system and avoid some issues in the gut and do a transmucosely sublingual. Change the route of delivery to try to benefit the patient personally, personalization. Right. So no, we can't do those studies because it's cost prohibitive that we can't have the model and sell that thing and admit whatever that thing is, I'll call it gorilla cylinder or tiger cylinder. <laughs> Whatever we're talking, there's no such thing I'm aware of. I think there is. Bert, somebody called me on that. There was a Berticillin. Really? Yeah, Berticillin. There's something. I did not know that. Yeah, but so, but you, you take that moiety and you say, okay, I can't do phase one, two, and three. But what I tell the compounders is they don't have to do this. Is create your own outcomes and your own type of thing. You know. A uh, 44-year-old female uh, uh, post-pedic neuralgia. We treated her topically with this combination or whatever. Her, her, not that we do pain uh, uh, analogs scores anymore, per se, but she was able to go back to work. She was able to improve her practices. She was able to put on her clothing because every time a piece of clothing touched the area. So, you know, you keep those things down. You say, I, you know, here's an outcome. Here's an outcome. Here's an outcome. So we are collecting those outcomes. And we're trying to say, okay, we have positive, because there's patients that can't take the norm. There's patients that can't take the normal dose, the normal route, the normal delivery system, and those type of things. So it's very, very important that we understand how these things. So I know the argument has been from pharma, from the FDA, and from the naysayers that say, this isn't FDA approved. Well, you know how many drugs actually aren't FDA approved? Thousands, right? Their products: morphine so, sulfate, potassium chloride. Those were before that they were grandfathered in. So we have all these drugs that are not necessarily FDA approved, but they're they're grandfathered in. And there, I'm not there, saying there, this there's way. a process there. Uh, yeah, there, 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 there is. is products, but there is, there is. But in terms of the argument I hear is FDA. These are not FDA approved to try to get these. They, they don't approve a draw a chemical they approve a product and these products haven't been submitted in these are preparations so you have to have the confidence in the people and in the regulations in the processes this is not mass production here we're not making one huge batch for many people yeah that whole one-on-one -on -one means a lot to me and that's what i promote to my clients so what, what this gentleman is is pointing out is 
So what you're really talking about is what's really cutting edge right now, which is using real world evidence and using that real world evidence to actually contribute towards, well, we have this evidence and this applies to this individual patient. And what is the implication of that? And you, you're you never going to do a study on three patients because it's just A, statistically, it's never going to work. Absolutely. And B, uh, from a scientific perspective, it's never going to pass that muster. However, patients are still going to benefit from it um, right. because they still need the help. So what, what you're really talking about is providing for those individual patients. Um, and that's not to say that you aren't going to start off with drugs that have not been, uh, whose safety and efficacy has not been previously tested. You're not starting off with brand new uh, APIs that no one's ever looked at. However, to be fair, it yeah. does remain that um, the, the new indication and or the new uh, dosage form and or the new dose may be different from what the FDA previously approved. However, that's exactly where the practice of medicine and the practice of pharmacy start. Right. Um, but uh, I do have to say this was supposed to be a much shorter talk, but it sounds like you've gotten a lot of people really excited, really involved. Um, I would love to have you come back and, and we do another talk. Uh, do you have any, Ken, before we, we uh, let off, any last words? Well, I just, I hope people can see through all of the blur in the fog and understand personalization of, of the treatment of patients is where it is. We map the genome, whatever. Compounding pharmacy is a, is, is a method, a, 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 a portal to allow that to happen even better. Because it's not just about genetics and genomics, it has to do with skin condition, it has to do with enteral condition, short gut, whatever, we have these ways and means. So I hope people get as excited as I am about that personalization piece about it. So there's a lot of potential there. Thank you again, Ken. Thank you. This is the Darshan Talks podcast, regulatory guy, irregular podcast with host Darshan Kulkarni. You can find the show on Twitter at Darshan Talks or the show's website at darshantalks.com.